Questions are still swirling surrounding last week's election results in Minnesota. The law firm that's taken a stand in court in the past to protect voters' rights weighs in. Next. The Upper Midwest Law Center has been working to safeguard election integrity in this state. Senior trial counsel James Dickey joins me. James, thanks for being here. Good to see you. Thanks, Liz. Always good to see you, too. So there have been multiple statements uh, made this weekend. We thought you'd be the perfect person to talk to about all of this as concerns remain uh, after specifically what happened in Sherburne and Scott counties. Vote totals changed despite 100 percent of precincts reporting changed in favor of Democratic House candidates. The Minnesota House remains now an even split due to those outcomes. But what is what's your take here? What do you think the secretary of state should be doing in response? Well, first of all, I think everyone in the state, obviously on election night, is watching these unofficial results come in. So it's extremely important that cities and counties get these totals right so that there isn't any appearance of a problem in the process. And I think we all understand that errors do happen. Uh, And the good news is that Minnesota does have a backup in the form of paper ballots filled out by each voter. Uh, But even though we use electronic machines, we do have paper ballots of all or paper copies of all ballots cast. Um, But the answer to citizens' rightful concerns about what's going on in Scott County and Sherbert County is transparency and equal representation at the ballot box. And I think the law does provide that in some ways. So, for example, all of the counting at the counting center under law is required to be open to the public. So, like, when Scott County does a rescan of all ballots that should have been open to the public and notice should have been sufficient to ensure that the public could observe it. Um, And all counting requires two election judges, one from each party, to observe the officials doing the counting under Minnesota Statute 206.86 Subdivision 3 at the counting center. But in terms of the Secretary of State's role, there's no question that the Secretary of State should be conducting recounts regardless of the percentage margin for either of the two seats that we're talking about in Scott and Sherburne County. It's a low cost to do this compared to the importance of making sure there's additional confidence that Minnesotans Minnesotans can have in the results. And doing a hand recount would give you that confidence. And the Secretary of State is specifically authorized by Section 206.88 of the statutes to do exactly that. So any failure to do that, in my mind, is a failure to uphold the primary duty of the Secretary of State's office. But I do understand that, at least in Sherburne County, there is going to be that kind of hand recount. On this issue, in a statement to Alpha News, a spokesperson uh, for Secretary of State Steve Simon said it's always valuable to remember that all posted results are unofficial until the post-election review process and canvassing board meetings are complete. But is there anything that can be done legally to make sure then that the math was really all legitimate? Well, it is an unofficial count. Um, You know, this is part of the problem with you know, inherent in the process that we have with our long absentee balloting season, absentee ballots getting at 8 p.m. on election night, you get data dumps uh, that come after other ballots have been counted and so on. You know, it, it, it is it's kind of crazy to me that we don't have a system like Florida where everything seems to be done by 10 p.m. <laughs> Eastern on election night and there is no problems. A far cry from the issues that it had when I was a teenager in Florida in the 2000 elections uh, and, and that whole back and forth with Bush and Gore. It's kind of crazy to see that, uh, you know, states like Minnesota and Arizona are so delayed in getting final final official numbers. So while I agree in part with the secretary that people should kind of pause and wait until the results are official and they're canvassed, the canvassing process where the official results happen isn't for uh, several days after the election. And you'd think that by election night, we should have a really clear picture without any back and forth and increases and decreases and changing in the numbers. Um, prior to them being uploaded to the Secretary of State's website. Yeah, it really is incredible just the, the differences uh, between states. Just rewinding a bit more here, James, it was just one week before the election, uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court said that Hennepin County failed to follow the law when it did not appoint election judges from the Republican Party. Then there was this scramble that, that kind of happened here uh, to, to fill those slots. I know the Upper Midwest Law Center was involved with this. Uh, did that happen then? Do you feel confident now in, in head of the county's system specifically? Take a step back to the Supreme Court decision in our favor. Um, the result was great for all Minnesotans because it was a thorough rejection of Hennepin County's clear attempt to lawyer its, lawyer its way around the clear dictates of the law. Um, 
I do think that Hennepin County, in response to the court's order, did take all the action that it was required to do by the law. And at the end of the day, we ended up with four Democrats and four Republicans on the absentee ballot court in Hennepin County. But of course, because Hennepin County delayed by 40 days in getting me, I made the request, the list of names so they could be cross-referenced to determine whether or not there was party balance. Um, we had you know, 40 out of 45 days of the 46 days of the early balloting season uh, without proper balance on, on the ballot board in Hennepin County. Um, so I think that's a major problem. Um, and I could give your listeners a quick recap of exactly how we got to that position, if, if that would be uh, a good good idea. Please, please do. Yes. So, yeah. So in May of every year, the county gets a list of all election judges who have gone to their political parties in that election year and said, I am a Republican or I am a Democrat. Pick me to be on the ballot board or to be a, a precinct judge on election day. Uh, so these are true believers. People that the party knows are actually devoted to their side of the aisle and they're going to be uh, looking out for the interests of their, their side in the process. And so the county is required by law to require to use the list that the, the parties have provided uh, in that manner to appoint election judges to their ballot boards. And those people on the ballot boards are the ones who are accepting and rejecting absentee ballots that come in. So the election judges in particular have the role of reviewing ballots which have mismatches between the identification number on the request for a ballot and the actual ballot return. So the ones that have a higher indicator that, hey, there could be a problem here. And here, Hennepin County failed to include any Republicans from the Republican Party list. And they claimed, in fact, to only have a single self-declared Republican who was moonlighting from his work on the Minneapolis ballot board uh, and also happened to be a city employee as, as, their, uh, as their lone Republican election judge. And they said they had the rest of their five were Democrats on the board. And so Hennepin County argued in court to the Minnesota Supreme Court, they, they, they didn't have to uh, use the lists at all. To, to constitute their ballot board because they gave them to the cities. They gave them to Minneapolis and Richfield and uh, you know other Hennepin County cities to fill out their election day precinct judges. So they said, oh, well, we just assumed that those people wouldn't be available. So we didn't even use them. So that means that none of the people on the absentee ballot board would come from the party list, even though the law specifically requires that that's the place they get them people from. Uh, and that's really absurd considering that they're hiring for a 46 day election season, not a single election day on this board. And there's no prohibition in the law on someone working a partial shift on election day and working a partial shift to the ballot board that night and so on. I'm not gonna get into all the details of that. But the Secretary of State's position, legal position was even worse than Hennepin County's as submitted to the Minnesota Supreme Court. The Secretary argued that Hennepin County had actually gone above and beyond the requirements of the law because Secretary Simon says, you don't even have to use the party list despite a clear statement from the Minnesota Supreme Court just two years ago, saying that, in fact, you do. And uh, in Hennepin County, the, one of the troubling things about the secretary's position here is that Hennepin County said in a press statement uh, by a county auditor to the press, they were relying on the secretary of state's guidance. And then the secretary of state comes into court with this, this position that is just totally out of left field and contrary to a very recent Supreme Court decision. Um, and the Supreme Court flatly rejected both of their positions and agreed with us that you have to look at the party lists and exhaust those lists. And wouldn't you know it that as soon as they did that and they reached out to people that there was substantial interest and they even admitted in one of their outreach emails to, to some people who didn't actually get selected to be on the board. Thank you. We had substantial overflow interest and we, we had already filled all the spots that we need. Go figure that when you actually do the work the legislature requires that it actually there are plenty of judges who are interested in the process. Yeah, and you can certainly see that a lot more uh, eyes will be on this moving forward. We've been in touch with some people that that went ahead um, and acted as judges in Hennepin County, and they're still questioning about things that that they saw when they were there to to witness it all. I know that um, the Upper Midwest Law Center has has had more successes in the past uh, in court, including uh, removing duplicate voter registrations in Ramsey County. But then when it came to challenging Walls Back Law, which allowed felons. Uh, this time around to vote in Minnesota. That court fight was unsuccessful. Just kind of big picture here, James, how difficult are some of these issues to take on uh, legally? It's, it is the Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Hunt case related to the felon voting law is particularly frustrating. Uh, first, I do want to correct the false media reporting on this case. A lot of uh, media reports said, oh, the Supreme Court upheld the felon voting law. No, they didn't. 
No, they kicked the case out on standing, which is a legal doctrine that says, oh, you don't have a stake in the game. They told the Supreme Court of Minnesota told the taxpayers of Minnesota that you don't have standing to challenge a law that, in my view, clearly violates the Minnesota Constitution. Um, just because uh, they, they said that all oh, the spending that was actually literally allocated to implement this law is just incidental to the process of, of, of registering people to vote. So, you know, it's just this this is the kind of argument that only a lawyer could love. Um, so it's really clear to me, having reviewed Minnesota's constitution and historical statutes, that felons still serving their sentences are constitutionally ineligible to vote um, because the constitution requires restoration of their civil rights, plural, and not just the right to vote, which is what the legislature did. In terms of the difficulty of finding these decisions, I mean, if you don't have standing to, to sue, you don't have an ability to get into court to stop it. So, you know, for example, when the folks who are convicted felons still serving their sentences went to the Supreme Court of Minnesota uh, the year before that the legislature changed the law and the, and the Supreme Court upheld the law as, as it was in place at the time that didn't, re didn't allow felons to vote until completing their sentences and getting discharged, having their, their rights restored through a discharge of their conviction. Um, they had standing, right? Why? Because they were, in, they were personally harmed, as they claimed, by a law of general applicability that provided that if you commit a felony and you're still serving your sentence, you can't vote. So it's really a one-sided ratchet that only if you are interested in expanding uh, what constitutionally ineligible people to vote that you can bring a lawsuit. But if you're saying, hey, we want to adhere to the Constitution, we want, as taxpayers, we don't want our tax dollars spent on violating the Constitution, you don't get a say in court. That is that is what's really frustrating. And this is this happens all the time. So, you know, well, we have a pretty good track record in court, I feel. But we, when we lose cases, it's often because the government has a million extra defenses created by the courts that they love to rely on. And they never, you know, get punished for bringing up an absurd argument that is intended to, you know, obstruct a decision on the merits. And I always say that the government wakes up on third base and they think they hit a triple. It's pretty absurd. Um, but we spend time and resources, often years, fighting over these defenses. Uh, they... You know, I, I always say, if you really believe in your position, just fight on the merits. What's the what's the, what's the harm? Um, but anyway, like I said, we 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 spend our time fighting on these defenses. We've gotten good precedent, basically striking down some of the the efforts to use bad defenses in cases like like you know standing arguments and things like that at different courts. So you know, there there is progress being made on that front, but it is a frustrating upward upward battle against the government whenever you bring a lawsuit against the government. And meanwhile, there have been several law changes, uh, even under the DFL trifecta that took place uh, when it comes to voting. So the public isn't allowed to see cast vote records anymore. The receipt uh, basically from voting machines. Uh, residential addresses are no longer uh, needed to register to vote in Minnesota. If a precinct has used a machine before, it basically must stick with the machine moving forward. You know, is it fair for people, do you think, to be skeptical of, of what's gone on here, James? And do you expect uh, some of these issues to be addressed and perhaps changes made in Minnesota under a Trump presidency? Well, I, I would first note that it used to be the case before last session that all election law changes were bipartisan. Uh, that went out the window last session. But I think that people's skepticism is fair, and I'm in the Minnesota legislature, I mean. I think skepticism is fair because these the changes to the law that we're discussing make it harder to confirm that voters are eligible voters. Um, but I would like people to take heart that we at the Upper Midwest Law Center and our friends at the Minnesota Voters Alliance are continually monitoring, investigating the impact of changes in the law related to election issues. But stuff like the Hennepin County absentee ballot, gerrymander, uh, the unsecured absentee ballots in the back of a minivan in Edina, uh, the claimed loophole for that process that, oh, this could, this could be delivered by just a courier instead of having two different party election judges to guard and deliver the absentee ballots. That's a real, those are all real problems. I'd also note that the lack of provisional balloting in Minnesota on election day registrants, um, that's a real problem when you consider that, you know, someone only has to sign an oath on election day to register and driver's license is one form of proving you're a resident. So that driver's license doesn't say you're a citizen or not. So the only thing guaranteeing that a citizen is voting is their own word. Uh, these are all real concerns. But under, I would say this, under no circumstances is it justified for anyone to talk about or tell anyone else that the elections are rigged and there's no point in voting. I think those are foolish and counterproductive statements. I would, I would say, although the cast vote records, I think are, it shouldn't be non-public data, which is what the legislature did, Minnesota is a paper ballot state. 
So ballots are almost exclusively filled out by people, except in very rare circumstances when you use uh, a poll pad to, or a marking device to help you fill, to fill it out. And all ballots are kept for a possible recount. And hand recounts do happen at random precincts every election, and they confirm the results of the tabulator. So, and I'm not aware of any exception to that. But think, and also think about the logic. If you're, if you're right that the, the, you know, this, the tabulators are rigged and that it's not going to work, then you lose and there's no record and, and you don't vote and there you lose and there's no record of flip votes that could be uncovered later that but if you're wrong about the tabulators being rigged then you definitely lose because you didn't vote so you lose either way if you don't go out and vote and history you know shows that it's not true that uh that uh you know elections can't go conservatives way um trump won in 2016 almost won minnesota and just won in 2024 nationwide republicans in the house just ended the trifecta and brought balance back to the state house so you know, I think that I think that while there are serious problems and Minnesota election laws need substantial change, um, I do think people need to make sure they get out and vote and vote early and, and make sure they get their vote counted for based on the laws that we have right now. Do you think the Trump presidency will help to fix some of these these issues in Minnesota? I think that there is there is substantial ground that the federal government should cover. Uh, I'm a big fan of federalism, so I like states being laboratories for democracy. I like the idea of dispersing power across the 50 states. And when you wield the federal sword, there's a chance the other side could take control and undo what was done. Um, so the state still needs meaningful reform. But our founders made it very clear that in federal elections, this is one area where having nationwide rules is allowed and quite sensible. Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution allows Congress to, uh, by law, make or alter state election law. So I do think that there's going to be federal changes. I think, or at least there's going to be proposals for federal change. Congress recently in the last session, it didn't go through, of course, um, I believe Pat, or they, they had at least a vote and uh, in the House on the uh, potential uh, bipartisan reforms to voting laws. And I think election, I think a federal election law could require voter ID and proof of citizenship, which are common sense bipartisan reforms supported by substantial majorities across both parties. And I also think that under in terms of federal law, all states should be subject, including Minnesota, which currently has an exception to the National Voter Registration Act. It's public list disclosure requirements and uh, voter registration list maintenance requirements. It's very important. And there's no compelling reason why all states shouldn't be removing people from the voter rolls who are ineligible to vote. Uh, the safeguard against removing eligible people is easy. Register again if there was an error. And that's what we saw in Virginia, I believe, in this last, uh, in the last bit of lawfare for the 2024 election. Uh, same day registration is possible to be done right as long as there are provisional ballots in Minnesota. And we don't even have that in Minnesota. There's a lot of good that can be done at the federal level. But one last point is that at the state level, still, the Minnesota Supreme Court said in an Andy Selick versus Steve Simon's lawsuit in back in, I think, 2018, the Secretary of State could be providing the list to people in the public to let them uh, review it for the Secretary, to, for outside groups to come in and help to ensure that people who are, in fact, eligible to vote are voting uh, or are registered, excuse me. And that's not happening because the secretary of state is withholding that list, for example, from the Public Interest Legal Foundation and others who are outside of the state under state law. Upper Midwest Law Center senior counsel James Dickey, who we may or may not have caught uh, on a much deserved break. But thank you so much for, for joining me. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Liz. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. And for everyone out there, support Upper Midwest Law Center at umlc.org slash donate. And that will do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. We will see you next time.